on our social media accounts and we're expecting COS Live. I'm sorry to disappoint you, uh, but it will be returning at its normal time next week. We shuffled everything around here a little bit this evening for a convention of states because we wanted to accommodate uh, tonight's guest, who is an amazing, amazing friend of Convention of States. He's the Blaze TV host, uh, the best-selling author of two books now. And also, as of the end of this week, he will be adding executive film producer to his resume. Uh, of course, that's our great friend and our buddy, Steve Dace. Steve, how are you doing this evening? Uh, I'm a little sore. I'm not the only one who's got a pet that wants to get in the shot. You can probably hear my dog over here. Um, but uh, I'm a little, I'm, I'm a, actually, I'm a lot sore. I'm a little loopy. Um, so I don't know what happens when I'm drugged up, you know, and I do one of these. So I might actually, maybe I'll do the opposite. Most people have loose lips when they get drugged up. Maybe I'll actually more, be more tight lipped, I guess. We'll, we'll find out. Well, I hope not. We want to hear everything that's been going on. Uh, but before we get started, uh, for those of you who are new to Convention of States, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for taking the time out of your evening to join us. Um, and if you're not familiar with us, we're a grassroots movement focused on the goal of utilizing Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution to call a Convention of States in order to propose amendments to the Constitution that would reduce the size and scope of the federal government, impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, and place term limits on all members of Congress and federal officials. In order to hold this convention, we need 34 states to pass our resolution. And to date, we have 19 states that have done so. So we are super happy that you took the time to join us this evening and welcome. Uh, also, if you have some questions, if you're joining us on, on any of our platforms, we have people standing by to try and answer them. Please, if you're on GoToWebinar, please ask away in the chat. We'll answer as many questions as we can. We also have some handouts available for you Again, if you're on GoToWebinar, you can download them. If you're on uh, any of our social media, we're going to be sharing some links. We have uh, the frequently asked questions, so hopefully that'll answer any questions that you have. We also have the Lamp of Experience article written by Professor Robert Nadelson that talks about convention and why we think the amendment process will work. Many people think that it won't. Uh, we also have our pocket guide. Uh, we have a pocket constitution, and we also have the digital uh, copy or PDF of the process of Article 5. So you can download those uh, and click on any links that we share with you if you're on our social media accounts. Also, I want you to stick around to the end of the program. We are going to have a special guest join us to talk about an incredibly big announcement that we have with Convention of States. So join us, uh, stick around through the entire program, and you'll catch that special guest. All right. So Steve, uh, it is an absolute blessing to have you with us tonight, um, especially after the crazy night that you had last night. Uh, so we kind of talked about it a little bit. You explained how you're feeling, but would you like to share with everyone exactly what happened? Sure. Uh, I uh, Thursday, I, I had I noticed I had uh, a, an infection, a little swelling. You know, I, I've got a, as you mentioned at the top, uh, Jonathan, I've got a few things going on right now, you know, so I. I did the the stupid uh, fake macho guy ain't got time to bleed power through kind of thing, and as we got through the weekend, it got much worse. And then um, I woke up Monday morning, and I mean, I, I was just in searing pain. I mean, it was pretty bad. And so, wife finally convinced me to go into the uh, um, the uh, urgent care clinic, and they they were limited in what they could do there, but uh, they were able to give me. Uh, some pain relief and uh, a pretty um, aggressive injection of antibiotics. And, you know, that was enough. I thought I was okay. Went and did the show Monday. Uh, I had an entire afternoon of meetings and or uh, publicity interviews for the film lined up. So after the show, I had another four hours of those to do. And I think I used whatever adrenaline to do those I had left. And then shortly after they were done, um, my body just gave up. I had uh, convulsions, trembling, chills. Um, my temperature went out of whack. Uh, I started to babble incoherently. My wife says the worst she's ever seen me in 27 years. And uh, we rushed to the ER and uh, uh, I had, I had a, a pretty massive bacterial infection of, uh, what do they call it? A bacteria infection of unknown cause or origin. 
uh, and uh, um, they had to um, they had to basically carve it out of my uh, out of my torso to get rid of it. And I still have a hole in my torso as we speak. It's draining more as we speak, which is probably too much information for everybody here on the call. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was pretty scary there for for a while. I don't remember a lot of it. Um, I was in and out of uh, you know consciousness basically, uh, you know, for a good period of time. But uh, um, the medical team up there at the hospital, West Lakes here in West Des Moines, did a great job taking care of me. And uh, my wife carried me last night the way Kareem Abdul-Jabbar used to carry Bill Walton up and down the court back in the day. And uh, so I needed a day to recover. You know, there's nothing that uh, a good deal of prayer and hydrocodone can't solve. Okay. And so I'm sore. I needed a day to recover. I've done that today. I, I should be back at it again tomorrow. But it's funny. I, in, in, in over five years, I've taken exactly two sick days. That's it. And, and, and it's interesting, the coincidental timing of each of them. Uh, the first was when we got back from Oklahoma in December of 21 and got done filming Nefarious right before Christmas with all the attempts to shut it down and everything else. And shortly thereafter, Christmas night, I'm in the ER because I have this massive, again, bacterial infection of unknown cause or origin in my finger that they have to they have to pluck and drain from my finger and maybe the worst pain I've had in my entire life that I can remember. And then we had our red carpet premiere for Nefarious this week. We ended up with almost a thousand theaters after despite the glut of movies that uh, Hollywood is dramatic has just coincidentally decided to release the same weekend that our movie came out. And now I'm in there the, the night after Easter uh, with another bacterial infection of unknown cause or origin. Those are the only two times I've missed work for being sick in over five years. Awfully coincidental. Yeah, a lot of coincidences in there. Um, yeah. uh, just amazing. But um, we are incredibly grateful and thankful that you still were able to come on and power through and join us here this evening. So many people have been praying for you and your health and your safety. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. I even see people in the chat saying that they've been praying for you and and so glad that you were able to join us. So thank you so much, Steve. We really, really appreciate I, it. I, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, I have just been um, my wife just told me a little while ago, apparently pray for Steve was trending on Twitter last night when I was basically unconscious. I am just, I mean, the, uh, we're overwhelmed at the amount. I, I, I've spent most of my day just responding to all the text messages and emails I have uh, received. I'm, I'm just, we're, we're just both, Amy and I are both very overwhelmed. So thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so now back to what we were going to originally talk about before uh, craziness happened, or those coincidences as we're referring yeah. to them. Um, and I don't think there's any reason for us to beat around the bush. We wanted to shuffle our schedules here because we want to talk with you about the movie that's coming out on Friday, Nefarious, which is based on this 2016 book, A Nefarious Plot. Uh, so tell us, what inspired you first to write the book, and then share with us how it became a movie? So I, my my first wide release book was called Rules for Patriots, which I wrote as an antidote to Rules for Radicals. And I was uh, I was brought to Washington D.C. to do some publicity for that, Jonathan. And uh, as I was in the shower getting ready to head out, this voice in the back of my head says, "This book is dedicated to all the useful idiots out there, especially those of you who had no idea that you were being used all this time. For you proved to be the most useful idiots of them all, nefarious." And I thought that is a weird thing to just have pop into the back of your head out of nowhere, you know, and so started thinking about it and, um, you know, set it aside for a few hours to go do my appointments. I get back to my room later that night and sit down at the keyboard, start playing around with it a little bit and uh, um, started come up with coming up with the idea. I mean, I, now that I've written one book that people have actually bought, I'm, I am qualified to write sequels to C.S. Lewis's works. Why not? I mean, Barack Obama wrote two autobiographies before he was 40, so I'm qualified to write a sequel to C.S. Lewis's stuff, okay? And uh, so I, I sat down and just started playing and tinkering with the idea of a sequel to a screw tape letters. And, you know, in any sequel, the, the threat's got to be even bigger, right? You know, and so instead of the, the takedown of, of individuals, what about the destruction and takedown of an entire culture? And um, this, this character I created or was inspired 
uh, named Lord Nefarious that was tasked by the devil with the destruction of America. And in that book, A Nefarious Plot, he lays out, you know from having read it, names, names, connects dots, real events, real movements, real historical um, occurrences, and how he used them and why he used them to destroy America. And he puts it in book form basically to brag, but also to show his master, the devil, that by admitting to our faces what he has done and the fact that we still won't turn away from it, that is how he'll prove to Satan that his plan has been successful and it's irreversible because we just won't even take the evil seriously when it's thrust into our face. And um, I was talking about it uh, with a guy that I work with now that I didn't even know at the time named Glenn Beck, who had read the book. And he had me on his show to discuss it. And uh, some guys at a new company called Believe Entertainment were driving around in Burbank, California that morning, getting ready to start pre-production on a movie that they were working on called Unplanned, which was Abby Johnson's expose of her time working for Planned Parenthood. And they were wondering, hey, what's our next movie going to be? And they they had they heard me talking about this. And they're like, wow, this sounds dynamite. They go and get the book and then uh, read it that afternoon and then contact me that night. My wife said a, a women's retreat. I'm down here in the man cave after putting the kids to bed because it was like eight years ago. So they were all still relatively young. And uh, uh, after I put them to bed, you know, I fire up the Madden here in the man cave to get, you know, some downtime. And I get this alert on my phone and, and, and it says, hey, we're so and so and we want to buy the movie rights to your book. And I thought it was like a Nigerian print scam, you know, so I deleted the email and went back to playing Madden and a uh, little voice in the back of my head strikes again and says, eh, I think you might want to reconsider. You want to look that up. That might be legitimate. And I, I did. I looked it up. They were legit. Um, these are the guys that had written God's Not Dead. Um, and uh, uh, we negotiated for the next couple of months. Christmas of 2016, we signed uh, the deal to give them the movie rights. And then, you know, we waited for them to make Unplanned, which is a fantastic movie. Um, this movie is at a completely different level from Unplanned. So just as, you know, in terms of, of, of subject matter and material, Unplanned was a step up or two from God's Not Dead. This movie is a definite step up or two from, uh, from Unplanned. And I, I, would, I would say that um, we, have, we have managed to accomplish something here that has rarely been tried. And, and I think that's to our detriment, frankly, as believers. And that is to address supernatural matters that the that the public is attracted to in a tone and in a format that they are attracted to in terms of what they will go see at the movies but it will be done explicitly without any in, any explicit content no f bombs not a drop of blood um, you know no nudity yet it will be also be explicitly from a biblical worldview at the exact same time. You know, I was watching a, uh, a review from a pastor who's got about 700,000 YouTube subscribers earlier this afternoon, and he was telling his YouTube base, this is the most theologically accurate movie he has ever seen. All right. And so um, we, uh, we did this on purpose. And I, I understand with our marketing and stuff and uh, that, you know, hey, I, I love our movie poster. I helped design it. I wouldn't put it in the lobby of my church either. OK, but um, it's not for you. Uh, we made this movie and, and we're marketing it in a way that you can show your unbelieving friends and family members. You could show them our poster, show them our trailer, and they're going to be like, oh, that's cool. That's dope. You know, you should go see it. And you're going to be like, yeah, we'll go with you. You should go see it. But trust me, once we get in the theaters, you're going to be the one entertained. Because we will absolutely confront their secular um, and, and pagan worldview in the film and force them to come to grips with its true origin in the film. And in our movie, we will, we will tell the viewer the bad news that many American churches won't tell you anymore. And after we've slapped them around for a good hour and a half, and it'll be entertaining, it's a well-made film. But after we've slapped them around for an hour and a half, you take them out afterwards to pizza, to ice cream, or to dinner, and now you can introduce them to the good news. But I... We, we just really think all of us that were a part of this film, we think that the cultures heard, heard it all from the uh, Hawaiian shirt pastor, the pleated uh, khaki pastor, the sweater vested pastor, the skinny jeans pastor. They don't care. They've rejected all of that. They don't care. So it, it, what they need to be confronted with the reality of evil and that, frankly, a lot of the origins of their unbiblical worldviews aren't just a difference of opinion. It's evil. And they need to be confronted with that. And in this film, they will be.
it, I have to say the movie looks absolutely outstanding. I watched the trailer more than more times than I want to admit. <laughs> um, it seems like it's going to be a great, great movie. I can't wait to see it. And I know I was actually with uh, our president, Convention of States, uh, Mark Meckler, after he had an opportunity to catch the screener and he loved it. He was raving about it. But I have a question for you. You talked a little bit about um, un the unbelievers and, and how you were marketing it. You've had an opportunity to be with Convention of States people. You were you were in um, uh, at, at our leadership summit in Orlando. Why do you think Convention of States supporters and activists should see this film? There was a, a Wall Street Journal poll about a week and a half ago of where values are at in America. And uh, they're not in a good place, okay? When only one third of Republicans think having children is important, yikes. And the only value that has increased since uh, the Wall Street Journal started asking these questions in 1998, the only value that has increased is the pursuit of money. And it's, it's fascinating that you'll see the, 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 the trajectory on their, on their chart of religion and patriotism are almost in the exact same uh, trend line. And that's not a coincidence, okay? I mean, I think when if, if, if you are gonna have a very difficult time preserving a republic based on the idea of God-given rights amidst a people that don't believe in God, that, that could be problematic, okay? I mean, but, but imagine, hey, I, I wanna be a math professor, but I don't believe in mathematics. Well, I mean, Okay, I mean, that would, that would seem to be a bit of an obstacle to your quest to be a successful professor of math. You said you don't believe in, okay? And and I, I think that there's, there's two arguments against what we believe here. One of them is frankly just a difference of opinion. And I, I can see why some people may say they are concerned about a runaway convention given how runaway the country has become, do we wanna open up that can of worms? Now, I understand why people of conviction would have that position. I, I actually think it's the opposite, exactly. I, I think that um, it's because the thing is so wayward in mass that this may be our, I, I think it's very well our last opportunity to save our constitution, which is to create a mechanism that the constitution provides for, by the way, uh, an article five uh, convention of states, provide a mechanism by which the, the side that is the most committed and organized will be the most successful in utilizing said vehicle rather than, you know, the masses are asses, for lack of a better phrase, if you know what I'm saying, okay? I, I, will, I, will, I would much rather fight the other side. If, the, if, if we're, if, I'd rather much fight the other side like David versus Goliath, mano a mano in the Valley of Elah, than each of us trying to reach the multitudes at the same time. I think we have shown on the right, we're not very good at that, okay? Not to mention on the left, they hold, they hold all the weapons, TV, pop culture, that are the best at reaching the masses anyway. So in, in, in this arena, I think we can win. A, parliament, a parliamentary arena of activism and commitment and conviction. You know, there's a reason why in the Republican party, when we have caucuses or closed primaries, the more principled candidates win, and when we have primaries or open primaries, the, the more liberal candidates win. Because any, you know, any moron can come in and vote. Then when we reduce it down to the people that, you know, are the most committed to the process, I mean, look at Virginia. How does Ken, Ken Cuccinelli win a Virginia gubernatorial primary? Because the activists were smart enough to get rid of the primary and we're just going to nominate at a convention. Well, then only that, only the people that are the most committed are going to be there. I'm from Iowa. So I, I know what peculiar processes do. They immediately weed out people who are soft-headed and not really committed, right? And so that's why we—that's why people like Mike Huckabee and Rick Santorum and Ted Cruz have won here, while guys like John McCain and Mitt Romney won the nomination. So I don't know. I mean, I, I look at the the track record of of more difficult and peculiar processes tend to yield the results more better to my worldview. So you know, I view the convention of states as a as a peculiar, more difficult process. Uh, then just go in, pull the curtain and vote for anybody that uh, the media told you was grand, okay? I, I'll take my chances with that than, than with the multitudes. The other argument against us is, well, 
we just don't want to save America. We, we are actually trying to undo it. And that is the more prevalent argument. I, I think for the people on this call, you wrestle with the argument I was just describing because most of the time you're arguing with your, your fellow conservatives or non-communist patriot, okay? And so you're arguing kind of like in your own subculture. But the larger argument against this really is, well, why would we want to save a country we're trying to destroy? And, you know, the world is divided into two kinds of people, sheep and wolves. And sheep, sheep don't know, wolves don't want to know. And one good way to find out if that unbelieving friend and family member of yours is a sheep or a wolf is take them to a movie like this. And if they're moved by it, then you know, okay, they just didn't know. And I've got to, I, I have a chance to change their mind and persuade them. If they're not moved by it, then you know the heart is hardened and it's time to move on. And, and I think that um, it is no coincidence that patriotism, back to the original point, patriotism and religion have downward trended at the exact same time because in, in our form of government, a republic based on God-given rights, a constitution that is the, um, the, the, the codifying of a social compact, those two things have to be the DNA. That's what Benjamin Franklin means when he says a republic if you can keep it. That's what John Adams means when he says this constitution was meant only for a moral and religious people. It was wholly inadequate for any other type. All right. And so if, if you are going to try to use this mechanism or any mechanism by which to save this constitutional republic, um, your, your odds go higher if you have more people that believe in God than don't. Excellent. And if folks want to see the movie, how can they learn where the movie is going to be playing? Sure. Uh, go to nefariousTickets.com. Again, that is nefariousTickets.com. And um, right away when you log in, um, we'll, it'll, it'll prompt right away to help you find the theaters closest to you. Or you can even look up other cities, other zip codes there if you want. Uh, you can pre-order tickets if you want. Right now, it looks like we're going to be in a little bit less than a thousand theaters across the country when we open this weekend. So much better chance that you're going to find a theater within 20 to 30 miles of you now than we had about three weeks ago. OK, so we have done very well. And it's because our pre-sales have gone so strongly that a lot of theaters now have come forward to give us more screens because they see our people are buying tickets. So nefariousTickets.com, that's where you can go. That's awesome. And I know that there's a theater less than 10 miles from here that's that's going to be playing it this weekend. So hopefully we'll be able to get out there and, and check yeah. it out. But as if that movie uh, wasn't keeping you busy enough, <laughs> a few months ago, you had uh, the release of another best-selling book co-authored by Daniel Horowitz called Rise of the Fourth Reich, Confronting COVID Fascism with a New Nuremberg Trial. So this never happens again. And uh, it's a title that definitely grabs your attention. But as you read the book, I've started to read the book now, um, you realize just how appropriate a title it is. What led you to writing this book with Daniel? Um, and it's kind of almost a sequel to your other best-selling book, uh, which was Fauci and Bargain. So apparently all my best or worst ideas come in the shower, Jonathan. And it's <laughs> frankly, because it's one of the few times a day that I am alone, quiet, and I guess uh, reachable. OK, um, in that context. But I was listening. I was in the shower. I was listening to Daniel's podcast um, at, at Conservative Review. And and I, I was just how powerful and impactful these interviews he was doing with people that were greatly in, impacted and affected by covid fascism. And I mean, I, I, I think I'm probably in the you know upper echelon of people in media informed on this topic over the last few years. And I found myself often learning stuff and learning about people for the first time via Daniel's podcast, you know. And so um, after I, I after I got out of that shower, I called him up and I said, listen, man, we have this work is too important. Uh, it, it needs to it needs to be a broad to reach a broader audience. And if if you're putting stuff on your show that I am hearing about and learning for the first time, then that's got to be true of even a lot more of just the general population that doesn't do this for a living full time like you and I do. You know, and so um, Daniel won't do something just for money. Uh, and so I had and neither will I. It's just um, he's driven by money even less. than. What, here's what I love about Daniel. He cares about having friends even less than I do. He's driven by money even less than I am. So 
I, I actually, when, when him and I are together, I get to be the nice guy for a change. <laughs> I get to play good cop. Um, and so I, I needed to come up with a concept that he thought was worth his time. So it didn't just look like he was trying to recycle his own content, you know, for an additional revenue stream. And I, I told him about uh, Lee Strobel's book uh, from about 15 years ago, a ca The Case for Christ, which was huge in my own conversion. But the format of that book, you know, the crime reporter for the Chicago Tribune, um, skeptically interviewing uh, a lot of these Christian thinkers, philosophers, apologists, and 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 much of the book you're reading. I mean, he narrates the book. He narrates the bookends of the interviews, but much of the book is the actual interviews with these figures as he is trying to cross-examine them. And I said, let's borrow that and frame it like a Nuremberg trial. We recall witnesses. We have an opening statement, a closing statement. Um, because he's Daniel Horowitz, he wanted to throw in an appendix where he could give you the most specific uh, itemization of policy humanly possible, okay? Sometimes when I read Daniel, I'm reminded of what, what Peter writes about Paul in the Bible. Some of the things Paul writes are very difficult to understand. Nevertheless, listen to them anyway, okay? And uh, um, I, I'm very proud of the book. Um, I, I think it's the most important work I've ever done from a writing standpoint may end up becoming the most important work I have ever done because of the of, of the magnitude of the event we are covering. And, and I think in the next time that they pull something like this on us, they probably won't let people like me and Daniel Horowitz write a book like this, if you know what I'm saying, okay? And um, the book is a tough read. It's very well written, but you know, I, I, I will warn you, it is not the kind of book, you know, I like to read before I go to bed to wind, nope. No, I mean, if you, if you, you will not wind down. You will think where the gallows at, all right, at one o'clock in the morning, okay? I mean, you are gonna want justice for the people that you hear from in this book. And it's all real people. Nobody's anonymous. We have captured the original audio of every word and every interview that you will read in this book. And we have whistleblowers from the Department of Defense, the medical sector, victims of what, what happened. Um, it's it's a very, very, it's 400 pages, but it's a powerful read. And because much of it is formatted like eyewitness testimony, if a 400 page book can be a quick read, we made this one the quickest read it could possibly be. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that it's not an easy book to read because uh, my, my beloved mother-in-law, who may be watching, uh, actually gave me her copy because she just didn't feel comfortable reading it all. Uh, and I've only just started it, but as I as I read through it, you know, as angry and and furious as I am, to me, uh, and what helps me get through it is it re-emphasizes the need for a convention of states, right? It, this demonstrates how the government has been become so large that uh, there's no oversight, no accountability for the bureaucratic state. And it's now having deadly consequences, right? It's not just something to talk about or something that you joke about with friends or, or anything like that. This is serious. People are actually losing their lives because of the way our system has gotten so out of control. It also reminded me of a quote of yours that uh, our COS New Jersey team has put on t-shirts that the Calvary isn't coming. The answer is in the mirror. And we have to be the ones that take a stand and say enough is enough. I think this last election uh, disabused me once and for all of what whatever, you know, I know I, I talk a big game about we got to abandon the paradigm of watch Fox News all day and vote GOP to save America. But, I, I you know, I'm still a Gen Xer and I grew up in that paradigm. And, and you know, as Chicago once sang, you're a hard habit to break. OK. And. And so even as much as I rail against it, I find myself succumbing to it at times. And so this last election night, man, I'm down at the blaze for election night coverage. I wore my Tiger Woods red shirt for championship Sunday. All right. I've got the tubbo corn. OK. And I mean, I'm just going to sit here and watch the silent majority. All right. Because orange man bad's not on the ballot. So they don't have that excuse anymore. All my suburban neighbors that decided to sentence America to Abaddon because of, of Trump's poop tweets, okay? So let's pay for 20 bucks for a carton of eggs because you couldn't handle what Donald Trump tweeted that you probably never read anyway, okay? Fine, he's not even on the ballot now. And now they're teabagging your kids at the library and the public school. So now, now's the moment when 
that when then the silent majority, whatever's left of America, will stand up, Jonathan, and and cast these devils out. All right, in this last election, I was convinced of it. Convinced, man, I'm I'm ready. I tobo corn. I'm just gonna sit back here and watch the returns roll in and belly laugh. Okay, now about an hour and a half in, as I'm watching the trends, I'm like, the joke's actually on me. All right, there is th this added extra layer of uh, of American patriot that we always thought maybe was there and they just weren't as committed maybe as us, but you know, push comes to shove, they'll show up. Nope, Calvary isn't coming, man. Not happening, okay? Uh, and so this last election was the reminder. I mean, this country had been through hell the previous couple of years, and yet that was one of the most incumbent beneficial elections in modern American history. Virtually everybody that did the worst things to you could have imagined the last couple of years got reelected. And so, I, you know, I, I just think we're beyond a mass mobilization event culturally. I think I think too much of the culture is far is too far gone now, either too complacent or they've been they've been mind numbed into just not critically thinking on any level whatsoever. And that's, again, why fine. You know, Samuel Adams once made the great observation that it's it's tireless minorities that change history. And to me, what, we, what we're talking about here at Convention of States is a vehicle for that tireless minority. I, I go back to the event we did at my state capitol a couple of years ago that I spoke at. And, I'll, you know, the energy in that room, I will take, if you're telling me, all right, choose your fighter, like the old Mortal Kombat when we were kids, okay? Choose your fighter, all right? The energy in that room, the, the, the four or 500 people that were in that rotunda at the capitol in Iowa, on a cold January, and the energy in that room, choose your fighter. That group, right, a mechanism that empowers that group right there to, tr to have a maximum impact or trying to reach the masses of the, in, the, in the current um, epistemological nuclear winter called America. I don't, dude, I'm going to take my chances with the people that were in that Capitol Rotunda on a January morning. All right. They may not be large in number, but I know that they're committed. And so give me that level of commitment over, you know, trying to reach a fickle mob. And that's that's one of the reasons why I like this as a strategy. Amen. And folks, if you're interested in getting involved and joining us, please go to conventionofstates.com, click on the Take Action tab, sign up to become a volunteer, especially if you're in Iowa. We're close to passing our resolution in Iowa. We've made it through uh, committees in both the House and the Senate. We're waiting for floor votes there, and the clock is ticking. So we could use your help. Please go to conventionofstates.com, click on the Take Action tab, sign up to become a volunteer today. Uh, Steve, I've got a bunch of other questions here, but we've got some really good questions from the audience. So I'm going to move my questions off to the side here and, and address some of these. Brent wrote in, and um, this is actually a really great question. He said, if it comes to a national divorce, if we actually ar arrive at that point as a nation, we may already be there. What and how might that look like, in your opinion? What would a national divorce look like? Do you want me to be brutally honest to answer to this question? <laughs> what, we, would we expect anything less from Steve Dace? Okay. Uh, I love the idea of a national divorce uh, as a conception. Um, I don't think it's realistically achievable, though, and here's why. If we had a, if we were capable of having an official national divorce, that would mean we still had some level of respect for concepts like federalism, subsidiarity, things of that nature, and therefore likely wouldn't be in the very, the very bureaucratic, total state swamp mess that we are currently in. And I, I think we have to understand that what we are up against politically is not what we're up against politically, spiritually. This is spiritual. And it's not a coincidence that a, a half a dozen major companies just this last week decided out of the blue altogether that Dylan Mulvaney was their new spokesman. I'm sorry. Yeah, spokesman, I had it right the first time. All right. And it's not because they all went to the same consultant who told them well, you know, um, you guys will add, you know, uh, even uh, even more, uh, you know, dr you know, drinkers of, of Jack Daniels and Bud Light and consumers of your products um, by appealing to this insanity. No, they recognize Dylan Mulvaney is anointed. He's a priest, a prophet. 
um, and, 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 and the woke spirit of the age religion. And so this was just ecclesiology. They were honoring someone in their church with that anointing and giving him the, the bestowing upon him the honor that he has earned. And I think we have to understand when we're at that point, they won't let you leave. They're, they're, it's not a coincidence that the Jehovah's Witnesses knock on your door on the most beautiful Saturday every summer. OK, they don't ever knock on your door like in the middle of January. OK, because they're looking they're They really believe in what they're selling. And so they're looking for what's the most target rich environment when you're most likely to be relaxed. You're most likely to be around. You're most likely to be outside, you know, accessible. Similarly, this is their mindset. You need to be fixed. You're not one of the hundred and forty four thousand that will be saved. And and. They won't let you go. They didn't take over all your institutions just to say, all right, go your own way, Fleetwood Mac. Nope. All right. This, these are Jehovah's Witnesses with tanks. They're here to fix you. They're not going to let you go. Now, I do believe we can do, as my colleague Daniel Horowitz describes it, a self-sorting. What does that look like? Well, it looks like making, well, it looks like what Ron DeSantis has done in Florida, for example. Okay. So if you want to relocate to Florida, you're not going to get away with relocating to Florida the way that you can relocate to our buddy Mark Meckler's Texas, all right? Where I can hold on to all my, and this is what's happened. This is why you've lost cities like Houston, Austin, okay? That's what this is what's happened in Texas. We're, we're going to do job creation and just import all these voters who come here for low tax uh, uh, paganism, and end up, you know, eventually you, you'll import enough of those people. I remember reading the I remember the polls that showed Beto O'Rourke was in three points of Ted Cruz. I thought, no way, not even in this cycle, not even possible. On election day, he was in three points of Ted Cruz. All right. Why did why did that happen? Because you've invited all these Google type of companies into your state to provide all these jobs that apparently no other companies could provide when all they did was just take a bunch of Californians and ship them to Austin and, and Houston. That's all they did. And and, and now what, what DeSantis is doing because he is governing from a very socially conservative perspective at the same time, you're not, you're not, you're not like, well, you know, I really want to pedo groom the kids, but I hate a state income tax. Let me move to Florida. No, he's not, that's not happening because that, that, that's almost a self sorting because of the way that you defend the moral law in public. Like instead you'll read people go to places like the Atlantic to say, well, they won't let me pedo groom the kids in Florida. So I'm going to move out of this state right on. That's, that's exactly what we want. Maryland's calling. Massachusetts wants you. Go there. All right. Enjoy your winter. OK, self-sorting where, where, where our red states are every bit as red as the blue states are blue. We don't have that right now. You know, in, in West Virginia, um, a Democrat has not won a precinct. Forget county. Hasn't won a precinct in a presidential election since 2008. And yet of their two senators, Joe Manchin's the more conservative one compared to the Republican. All right. That's not good. And that needs to change. I mean, in places like Mississippi, Alabama, is Kay Ivey still pimping the poison poke? Still pe telling people that because you weren't wearing a mask, you got COVID? Okay. So Wyoming, Idaho, Alabama, Mississippi, South Carolina, you know, if you're sending Lindsey Graham to the Senate for 30 years, you're not it. Okay. But those states that we think are our reddest states, they need to be as red as California, Oregon, and Washington are blue. If we do that, then we can kind of self-sort, right? I mean, like a lot of our people wouldn't like voluntarily move to Oregon unless there was a really lucrative job that called them there. You wouldn't want to raise your kids there. So it works the other way around too. Like you want to create an environment where these kinds of people don't want to move to West Virginia and Alabama. Because we have a different value system than yours, and we will enforce it. It's a great question from Brenton. Uh, perfect answer, Steve. So thank you so much. Um, Vicky also had a good question, and this was about Nefarious. Uh, she said, what was the hardest part of handing your written work over to those who wrote the screenplay for the movie Nefarious? I, I, it really wasn't that hard. Um, I, I was very, I wasn't involved. I was, I was, I was close to the production to Carrie and Chuck, uh, Carrie, Carrie Solomon and Chuck Consum, the writers and directors of 
both unplanned and um, uh, nefarious. So I was close to them as they were making unplanned. And so I got a chance to see um, how they made a movie. I got a chance to read the script that they wrote. And um, you know, here, here is how I am wired. If you can prove to me you can do something better than me or you know more than me, I will always defer to you. I'm just gonna make you prove it to me, that's all. But, but if you can prove it to me, all right, cool. You know, and I and so seeing the caliber of work they did with Unplanned made it a much easier proposition for me to pass the baton on to them. And I can tell you now, and you'll see when you see the movie this weekend, they, whatever you think of my book, they have elevated my material. They made it better. So one last question I have for you, Steve. Um, I think you've talked about it a lot here tonight, and there's a there's a sense of, and even from the question that Brent wrote in. You know, there's a there's a, a a feeling amongst people that even though we know what the stakes are, that um, there there's still so much going on that people can feel demoralized and feel down, right? Uh, especially with the news headlines that are constantly hitting people. You know, whether it's the unjust indictments, ch children being slaughtered in schools, self-serving politicians looking away to take looking to take away Second Amendment rights. It just feels like there's a constant barrage of negative things that are coming out there. No matter what we do, we're going to still be dealing with that. I think someone also asked about, you know, the, is there a potential correlation between, you know, the the fact that there's no accountability for politicians uh, and people that are are doing these horrible things to us and the rise in 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 violence that we're seeing in our streets? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you talked a little bit earlier about some of the folks with Convention of States, some of, some conservatives in some of these states that are pushing back against our movement and trying to stop us from, from getting to a convention because they have this bunker politics mentality where they feel like, yeah, you know what, America's done. There's no, no hope for our country. Time to just hunker down and, and uh, put our heads in the stand and, and not engage in fight. What do you do to stay motivated and keep in the fight? And how would you respond to anyone that is ready to just give up? We just celebrated Easter. And, you know, um, my worldviews, Alpha and Omega, comes down to one question. Did a 30-something-year-old Jewish carpenter named Yeshua from Nazareth, did he die? And, ri and then rise to, left, rise to life physically again. Did that happen or not? Christianity does not begin with a, a dogma, a creed, but a historical claim of fact. Did this event occur? If it did, then proceed to the next steps of dogmas and creeds and theologies. If it did not, there is no next step, all right? If, if, the, if, if Jesus rose again, then Christianity is the only true worldview. If he didn't, then we don't know which worldview is true, because now it's a debate between all the other ones that are remaining in the world. And I bring that up in this context, Jonathan, because if you're if, if, if the plumb line, if the cornerstone of your worldview. Is that God supernaturally reached his hand into human history to raise his his dead son, whom was himself in corporal form and bring him back to life. then I, I just don't believe give up and cynicism comport with that i just don't i just don't think they they just don't mix i mean if you if you believe the last you know the bible says the last enemy death has been conquered in in the original greek do you know what the last enemy means the last enemy that's what it means when you translate in the original greek last enemy means last that's what it means all right which means all the other enemies we face now are in the in the eternal scheme of things no matter how overwhelming they feel are irrelevant. Every enemy you face now will be dead a hell of a lot longer than they were ever alive. And, and everyone right now within the sound of my voice, everyone, regardless of what your current belief system is, one day is going to bow a knee and with their tongue confess that Yeshua of Nazareth is Lord. It's just a matter of which side of the line will they will they be on when they finally make that confession. And I think for us, one way to stay motivated is to keep your eye on the prize, to finish the race. 
it isn't about the journey. It's actually about the destination. And if you if you know the destination you're headed, then as you reverse engineer or retcon things, the journey becomes more meaningful. Right? I mean, look at I can just take my own circumstance from this past weekend. I, I cannot even explain to you how miserable I was 24 hours ago. And I just got increasingly miserable over the next few hours. And um and 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 in the midst of this, I get an email telling me it's been a miracle. We've added like over a hundred more theaters here on, right at the deadline. We're going to hit nearly a thousand theaters. I've never seen anything like this. And and I don't know if these events are connected or not, but I do know this: that destination brought more meaning to me for how I was suffering at that moment. Like I had something to look forward to. Whenever this ended. I had something to look forward to. I, I, I was on mission. And so I, I think that the way that we stay motivated is to not focus on the process, but the destination. Because when the destination is pointed in the right direction, then that brings purpose to your process. And it doesn't feel like I'm just circling the drain. I'm just doing the same thing over again. What's the point of all of this, right? Like if you, if you, view, if you view what's happening in this world as a contest between good and evil, of equal opposing forces and it's still up for grabs, you're gonna feel a lot differently than if you view this as this contest, conquest, this contest has already been determined. We're just in the mop up police action portion of the, of the festivities here. And so there's a, there's a big difference between thinking you're getting Pearl Harbor or you're fighting the battle of the bulge, right? If I think I'm at Pearl Harbor, then I'm like, this is the beginning of an invasion. If I think I'm at the battle of the bulge, then I recognize this is the last gasp of a dying of a dying empire that I'm about to roll over once and for all, right? And so that's what I would say to our people to encourage them is to focus on the destination and then reverse engineer your thoughts on the on the on the path there from there. Excellent. And folks, again, if you want to be in the fight and you want to be with us, go to conventionofstates.com, click on the take action tab, sign up to become a volunteer. You know, Steve, you, you mentioned his words, you mentioned his name and oh here. You speaking, Mark? <laughs> I can barely hear you. Not hearing me. Uh-oh, there's a problem. He said, one second. All right. Well, you mentioned him, and he appeared. And as I mentioned before, we had a special guest that was going to be joining us for, for a big announcement. Uh, but it seems like we're having some audio issues. So hopefully, we'll get Mark uh, up and running. But um, Steve, absolutely, you know, we really appreciate you taking the time out this evening to be with us uh, and everything that you have going on. God bless you, man. And thank you so much for really taking the time to be here and everything that you're you're willing to do to fight back against all of the insanity that's out there. We're so grateful for you. Mark, are, are you oh, with us? You. Can you hear us now? Oh, he's still working on it. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, Jonathan. And, and, and I love being in the fight with you guys. You guys are coming at it the same way I am. And so we're brothers in arms. And so uh, I'm honored to be here with you guys uh, in the fight. And uh, thank you very much. And nefariousTickets.com. Absolutely. Stick around one second, though. I, I think Mark wanted to, to talk to you for a second. So hopefully he'll be able to jump back on. Uh, we did have um, a few other questions uh, from some folks. Let me just see here. Uh, they, were, they were asking the name of the book. Again, it's Rise of the Fourth Reich. That was the book that we were talking about earlier. Um, and that's written by Steve Dace and Daniel Horowitz. So you can check that out. Mark, are you back with us? Can you hear us? I do hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, before Mr. Dace leaves, I have to say some things that will flatter him and probably embarrass him. <laughs> and uh, I know he doesn't like to be cheap stuff, so I'm going to do it right now. Somebody rip me I right now. Somebody rip me right now, for goodness sakes. Yeah. Look, one thing I want to say is I've known Steve. We've, we've known each other for quite some time now. And uh, so the Steve that I know is the guy that you get to sit down at dinner with and hang out with and, and talk about the things that matter with. The most important thing that I want you to know about that Steve Dace is it's the same Steve Dace. This is not true of lots of people in the media. And I don't mean that as a slam on other people. I, I just mean, you know, people have a persona. And sometimes what they do on the air is their persona. And then you hang out with them. You're like, wow, this guy's way more chill or way more aggressive or whatever it is. You realize they're not 
the same person that you hear on the air. And what I want you to know is it's a, he's a man of total integrity. And to me, integrity means you're the same person on the air that you are off the air. And again, I don't mean that the people who have an act aren't that. It's just not an act for Steve. And the reason that you hear the passion that you hear from Steve when you hear him on the air or you listen to him talk is because he has that much passion inside him for what he's talking about. And so I've had a chance to experience Steve Dace off the air and his beautiful wife off the air. They're the real deal. And so that's, I, number one, really important. And he's a longtime supporter of COS. He's been in the fight for COS. He's willing to speak publicly about COS. Some people are like, yeah, I love it, but I don't, you know, I don't necessarily talk about it because it's kind of controversial and some people don't like it. Steve doesn't care because he's got, it's again, this is a man of integrity who's going to do what he believes. A while back, he sent me a, a chance to watch a teaser for Nefarious. And when I first got it, I'll be honest with you, I didn't want to watch it. And the reason I didn't want to watch it is because I don't do horror movies. And it's just kind of a thing I have. I used to when I was a kid. I don't like them. They put, I always feel like it puts a bunch of negative, violent stuff in my head that I don't want in my head. It's like, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So when Steve told me he was making a horror movie and it was going to be kind of a, in a way, a traditional horror movie in the traditional genre, I was like, I don't really want to see that. So he sent me the first link and I just didn't do it. And then he kept poking at me. Have you had a chance to watch it? Have you had a chance to watch it? I'm like, oh, man, Steve's my buddy, and I love him, so I got to watch the movie. <laughs> and I waited until Patty was out of town because she doesn't like horror movies at all, and I watched it. And it is, honest to God, one of the most compelling things I've ever seen in my entire life. It's one of the most impactful movies I've ever witnessed in my entire life. You know something's had a major impact on you when you can't stop thinking about it, and I can't stop thinking about it. It's now been, I don't know, three weeks ago I watched, maybe a month ago, and it's never, I, I think about it every single day. It's never far from my mind. I see stuff happen in the news, and I think nefarious. I talk to somebody, and I think nefarious. Anybody mentions, I'm in church, and somebody talks about, you know, the devil's here on earth, and, and Satan is actually the prince of this earth, and I think nefarious. And, and when I think about it, when I hear it, if I'm talking to somebody, it's like, hey, you have to see nefarious. You're not going to believe what an incredible, accurate, poignant, impactful presentation of the devil looks like. Because I don't think it's ever been done before. I literally don't think this has been done in, in the history of film. You know, the, the closest thing I could point to it, and other people have said this to me, have seen the movie, is screw tape letters. It's a, it is a modern day screw tape letter only, and I don't say this lightly, I, I, like I'm a C.S. Lewis fanatic, it's better. Because there is a measure of humor in screw tape letters, and the devil's not funny. It's not funny. It's deadly serious. Steve said something to me when I was talking about Patty, and I said, you know, I don't think Patty can watch it because I think it'll scare the hell out of her. And he said, it's not meant to scare the hell out of her, it's meant to scare the hell into them. So that regular people, people who wouldn't normally watch a Christian movie, people who don't normally think about the devil and demons, they're gonna watch this. They're not gonna understand why, but they're gonna be genuinely afraid because it, it points out things about the devil, about demons, about mass murderers, about cultural stuff that's going on right now, woke stuff and abortion that people don't wanna think about. And it all feels good and nice on the surface to them and women's right to choose. And they don't even know what that means. I will say, and I'm not going to spoil it, but the, to me, the most intense, most impactful, most, I don't even know how to say it, devastating, radical, wild scene in the movie is there's a discussion about abortion. And there's an incredibly impactful moment about abortion in the movie. And it is seared into my psyche. And, and watching the devil react, demons react to the idea of abortion and the accomplishment of abortion and how they think about it, and how they talk about it. I'll never, I already thought of abortion as a hideous, horrible sin. I'll never think about it the same. And so I say all that to say, uh, Steve has created a masterpiece. And it's you know, an incredible book that's led to an incredible screenplay that is executed incredibly well 
I mean, it's hard to imagine that a movie that's primarily a conversation between two men, and that's 90% of the movie, 95% of the movie, could be that impactful. You would think, well, two guys talking for a whole movie. How how exciting could that be? And it is intense, riveting, wonderful, inspiring, dark, light, hopeful, and scary all at the same time. And so I just wanted to congratulate my friend, our friend, Steve Dace, on the creation, not only of an artistic masterpiece, in my opinion, but something that I hope and believe will have a tremendous impact on our society for the better. I don't even know what to say, Mark. I'm just, uh, that's very kind, man. Thank you. Um, I know you meant at least half of that, which really I think is even more powerful. Um, I don't know which half, but I know you meant at least half of it. But, uh, we love you, buddy. That is, my, that is my immature dude way of completely deflecting because I'm just not comfortable with that level of praise because I'm emotionally immature. Okay, but uh, in all seriousness, man, thank you very much. I'm, we're from, from on behalf of everybody um, from the key grip, and I don't even know who the key grip of my own movie was. I just always loved that title, key grip. Uh, from the key grip to the directors and producers, all of us are very, very grateful for those kind words. And, um, it's be I, awesome. and I, I think people will find when they see the movie that Mark is probably only slightly exaggerating. I mean, it's really good. It turned out well. All right, so stick around, Steve, because I want you to hear this. I'm going to make a big announcement right now that most of our grassroots know. I don't even know if I've talked to you about it. There's something going on in this country that is true evil, and that is what's going on on our southern border. And we as a country now, and especially I would say I as a Texan and those of us in Texas, are complicit in one of the gravest humanitarian crises in the history of the world. Millions of people pouring across our southern border, 30 to 60 percent of all women and girls who are make the journey being raped, uh, little kids being sold into sexual slavery. We have the largest slave trade in the United States of America that we've ever seen. Slaves, like real slaves. And I don't want to sugarcoat, they're just slaves. A lot of them sexual slaves, but they're laborer slaves, domestic slaves. We have a slave trade in the United States of America. We have the greatest drug crisis in the history of the United States of America. Over 70,000 people a year dying from the scourge of fentanyl, poisoning, and overdoses. And I, I want you to understand the difference between those things. A fentanyl overdose, if somebody knows they're taking fentanyl, that's an overdose. A fentanyl poisoning is probably the majority of people dying from fentanyl. They don't even know they're taking fentanyl. Marijuana laced with fentanyl, opioids laced with fentanyl, heroin laced with fentanyl. These are not, are not people who are trying to overdose. I, I don't condone what they're doing, but they're not trying to overdose. You have regular people who got addicted to painkillers, doctors, engineers, construction workers with back injuries. Their doctors refuse to prescribe them opioids anymore because they were worried about addiction. There's a lot of pressure on that on doctors. So they went out and started getting them from some dealer on the street and it was laced with fentanyl and they are dead. 70,000 plus last year, one every seven minutes in the United States of America. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is how many more? How many more are we gonna allow this to happen to? How many more ranchers have to have their farms overrun, threatened by cartels, have to take a knee before the cartels? How many bodies do ranchers have to find on their ranches? South Texas ranchers, literally it's a morgue down there. Every day I talk to ranchers, they're finding the bodies on their properties. How many rape trees do the Border Patrol have to find with little girls' panties on them signifying that they raped women and children under these trees? How many more are we going to tolerate? Because that's really the question. We could point at DC, it's all Biden's fault and people do that. And I'll be frank, it's not just Biden's fault. Certainly there's blame there. Trump didn't do everything he could do either, to be honest with you. I talked to a lot of Border Patrol, they were frustrated. Their hands were still tied. And pre-Trump, this, this goes back 40 years, this problem. And the question is, how long will we as, and I'm going to say it as a Christian, how long will we as Christians be complicit in this? It's our government. It's your government. How long will we as Texans allow to have? We know right now D.C. is not going to fix it, and we know Texas can. The Texas legislature has the power. The Texas governor has the power. There are things that they can do that they have not done yet. And so on April 29th in Austin, Texas at the state capitol, that's a Saturday from one to four, thousands of us Texans and people from all over the country will be gathering 
I'll be the MC for the event. Ted Nugent is opening the event with his iconic rendition of the national anthem. Laura Logan will be there. Jason Jones, these are some of the top experts on the board. We have Mark Morgan coming in. Uh, a bunch of folks who are ICE agents. Uh, we have Virginia Krieger. She, she runs a group that is dedicated to the memory of all the fentanyl victims. She's what's called a fentanyl angel mom. And we're all gonna come together and we're all gonna get on a big stage and this is going to be a huge event. The producers, the people actually running the event for us, they do Super Bowls, they did the NCAA Final Four. Uh, we have the, the, the uh, production company that's driving all of it is the what, company that does Trump's rallies. So this is highly sophisticated production, multiple jumbotrons. How many people are gonna be there? I get asked this question all the time. I have no idea, man. I just pray to God that a lot of people show up. My worst nightmare is you get on stage and nobody's there. <laughs> so what we're counting on is all the grassroots activists all over the country coming in, come to Texas, be there April 29th. You can RSVP, you can learn more, howmanymore.com. Steve, I'll hit you with all this stuff and hopefully I can come on the show and talk about it. Because it needs to be a national thing because we just got to keep asking ourselves, how much more of this will we be complicit in. We can point at the politicians all we want. We can complain all we want, and we do plenty of that. But part of what Steve has done with Nefarious is he's trying to be a solution. He, he is creating a situation where people see we've got to do something, we've got to act in a certain way, and that's what we're trying to do with the How Many More rally. We are going to be there. We are going to put pressure on the politicians to do the right thing. Chip Roy, one of our top representatives from Texas who's really in the fight is gonna be there speaking as well. We really limited who we would let speak as far as politicians. If they're not in the fight, they're not speaking. Right? So this is a war and we are gonna step up as conservatives, as Christians, and we're gonna to fight to make sure that the right thing is done. The, the appropriate answer to the question, how many more? There's only one appropriate answer to that question in any of those categories. No more. This is it, we're done. We're gonna take a stand and it's not just a rally. This is where the movement starts to keep continual pressure on the politicians who have the power to do the stuff that's necessary to fix our Southern border. So Steve, thanks for sticking around and listening to that. Uh, that's all I got to say, man. I'm, I'm literally working around the clock right now, my normal job and, and then late into the night and early in the morning, a bunch of our staff is doing it. We're gonna make this thing happen and we're gonna make these changes that America needs. Well, we are, uh, you know, I'm in to help any way I can, help get the word out any way I can. Absolutely have you on to discuss. You know, Chip's one of my very best friends. Yep. I don't know anybody in elected office that has spent more time at the border than he has in the last few years. And one thing I can tell you is, and everybody that is watching or listening right now, whatever, however bad you think it is, I promise you that Chip can tell you from firsthand experience, it, the, re, the reality is actually worse. I mean, Chip has gone down there on like congressional delegations where you would think, you know, they 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 put them in the best possible situation for the most positive presentation. And literally it would be live on camera doing a stand up and a, and a young girl is getting human traffic like right over his shoulder on camera while he's down there. All right. And so um, I'm glad that you guys are doing this. It is it's truly a, it's an endemic evil that we have permitted to go on down there. Yeah, you know, it's funny, Steve, because when I when I think about it and, I, and I've learned over the last few months as I've been digging into this, what you just said, I thought it was bad. It's way worse than I thought it was. Every form of evil that you can possibly imagine is going on down there. And what what I've been thinking about since seeing Nefarious is Nefarious is right there in the midst of all of this and smiling and clapping in his hands and saying, I don't really have to do anything because you people are so evil all on your own. And and I think the other thing he would be saying, and it's so wonderful how you won't do anything to stop it. All yeah. this suffering and yeah. nobody doing anything to stop it. And so I, I'm going to tell you, the movie motivated me. I'm not I'm not going to stand by while Nefarious walks the earth and do nothing because I won't be complicit with his evil plans. Yeah. Amen. I mean, you look at, you know, women and minorities we're told the whole world revolves around women and minorities. I mean, I'm, I'm married to a woman. I've got two daughters. I'm kind of fond of women myself, okay? But we're told that the whole world revolves around women and minorities, and yet who is it that is the most absolutely devastated by what is going on down there? 
those groups and nothing can be done. And somehow, even though the whole world revolves around avoiding suffering of women and minorities, we can't do a damn thing about the singular event in this country that causes more of that suffering for those groups than by far anything else does. What does that tell you? It tells you that people don't want to fix it. And so it's our job to put so much pressure on them that they have to fix it. And look, this is how America's always been. We shouldn't look to leaders. We should be the leaders that we look to, right? If, if we want something done, one of the beautiful things about America is that we are a DIY nation, right? When, when something's broken, we fix it. So I've been talking about this. I have an ad that's running on radio down here, Stephen. One of the things I say is, look, this is how Texans roll. Something's broken, we're gonna fix it because that's what we do as Texans. Texas is a big place with a big attitude and we're gonna use that big attitude and that big place sort of approach to things. And we have a chance, people joke, you know, is Texas gonna secede from the nation? No, Texas is gonna save the nation. That's the goal here. Amen. All right, brothers. Folks, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening. We really appreciate it. And, you know, I think what this conversation, whether it's talking about nefarious or talking about this big announcement at how, of the how many more rally, and again, how many more.com, nefarious tickets.com, what I think it underscores is that we at Convention of States, as Mark was talking about, we're about solutions, right? There are some think tanks. Convention of States is a do tank. So if you want to join us and you want to be a part of the solution, Go to conventionofstates.com, sign up to become a volunteer, click that Take Action tab, and join the fight. Be in it with us. Be in it with Steve Dace. Be in it with Mark Meckler. Be the reason that we can save this country. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us for another Convention of States at Home webinar. Steve, we appreciate you, brother. We love you. So glad to see you. Thank you so much. Mark, we appreciate you taking the time. God bless you all, and we'll see you next time.